Hello there. Welcome to uh, our Google Hangout tonight. We'll be talking about eight steps to change your world. And this continues our Leaders Alive broadcast uh, that we started this afternoon on WJOB 1230 AM, Hammond, Indiana. And I'm Dr. Jeff Hale, the CEO of Well Spirit Consulting Group, and I'm joined by Dr. Renee Hale. Hello. Awesome. We're glad you're with us tonight. And we're just going to jump right in and start to talk about uh, the eight steps to change your world. And these are all found in Robert Quinn's book, Change the World, How Ordinary People Can Accomplish Extraordinary Results. And Quinn begins his book talking about the difference between normal change and deep change. And essentially normal change is incremental change, is change that we have some control over, while deep change causes us to uh, engage uncertainty. Uh, it fundamentally changes uh, the situation. It's uh, radical change. Uh, anything you'd like to add to that, uh, Renee, in terms of the difference between normal change and uh, deep change? I would just say that to remember that normal doesn't necessarily mean good. Normal means uh, describing what uh, most of the time just happens uh, by nature. It's just what we do. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's good. So normal is not what you're striving for. It's just a descriptor. It just says this is what usually happens with change as opposed to deep change, which is unusual. Um, it can be unusually bad, or it could be positive, too. There are deep changes that are quite positive. So, Right. And uh, so when we talk about... Uh, strategies of change, Quinn identifies uh, three normal strategies of change. The first is uh, telling. I tell you what I want you to do. Uh, the second is forcing. If you don't do what I tell you to do, then I use my positional authority to force you to do what I want you to do. And then a third uh, more effective, more, you could say, enlightened approach is a, a participatory approach where I involve uh, my followers to become involved in dialogue uh, to create change. So in the telling strategy, the emphasis is on uh, the use of rational persuasion using facts and uh, then in the forcing strategy, we're focusing on leveraging behavior using authority. And then in uh, the participating strategy, we use open dialogue uh, and leverage relationships. However, um, all three of those strategies at the base of them as, as an attempt to maintain the status quo. In other words, we see a problem happening and we engage in these change strategies so that we can take ourselves back to what we perceive to be normal. But in deep change, we'll see that we actually want to create a uh, a situation where there's some instability going on so that deep change, change that uh, disrupts the status quo can actually emerge. So Does that really create a new normal? Then instead of thinking of going back to some state of normal being, we're actually creating something new. Absolutely. So uh, we're going to uh, get in tonight and to, into the, the eight steps of creating uh, deep change or transformational change. And I, I just want to say uh, that all of those strategies are valid and useful 
and the great leaders actually use a combination of all four but they know when to effectively use and how to effectively use each one of those strategies. So, shall we jump into the eight steps here, Dr. Renee? Absolutely. Okay. I'm going to be uh, sharing my screen here and putting uh, some slides up. Okay, so you should see the eight step uh, a slide that says eight steps of deep change. Yep, I see it right there. It's taking awesome. up my whole screen. So awesome. Well, let me just give uh, an overview very quickly of uh, these eight steps. The first step is to envision the productive community. The second step is to look first within. The third step is to embrace the hypocritical self. The fourth step is to transcend fear. The fifth step is to embody a vision of the common good. The sixth step is to disturb the system. The seventh step is to surrender to the emergent process. And the eighth step, entice through moral power. So let's move on to the very first, envisioning the productive community. A productive community is a system of relationships, and it can occur in business or a community group or family in which the members share a common person and purpose you mean yeah a common what did i say person a common a person, common person. <laughs> <laughs> well they do share some people in common as well but yes a common purpose and uh each member of the group uh works for the benefit of the other uh the members uh, in a productive community become more inner uh, directed and other focused. They become guided by their their inner principles, their their values, and they're really focused on on helping others. And then finally, the people in higher positions see themselves as servants to those who are in the lower positions. So, uh, Dr. Renee, do you have anything that you'd like to, to add to, to that? I think just that it's, um, don't, don't be fearful of, of that to start with because it seems like an ideal thing that no one could ever reach. It's not, it's not about setting an ideal that's so high that you'll be disappointed that you uh, couldn't reach it. The idea is to imagine something at a level that you want to work towards. So if you set the bar pretty high, then you will be going towards something very worthwhile, and I think that that is the goal. Absolutely. Okay, then let's let's continue uh, with the next uh, step. Oh, there's there's more. <laughs> oh yeah, there is more about this one. <laughs> yeah, when we envision the productive community, one of the things that that really characterizes a produ productive community is clarity of purpose and then uh, very high standards of performance and high trust and supportive relationships as well. I mean those are the, and here we are, learning a learning and change atmosphere, right? Right, absolutely. I think, I think those are really great things to go for. I highly doubt that all four of those things could be uh, perfectly in place. You would be in a utopia of people if that were the case, but certainly those are the characteristics that we want to work towards. Yeah, and I think uh, while you might not do everything perfectly, you can, you can engage all of those uh, to, to a high degree. 
The second step is to uh, look first within. Once we once we have this this idea of the productive community and the, what we would like to create, uh, then we we look within ourselves, and that involves uh, making a fundamental choice about who I am and what do I stand for. And then once I make that choice, it involves continuously realigning my behavior with my fundamental choice. And then that changes uh, what I see and how I respond to my situation. So Renee, would you like to say anything here? I think it's important to know who you are and, and to know what you stand for and that is one of the things that I think will be challenged um, most of the time along the way in our journey. So to get it clear uh, up front I think is really important for ourselves more than anyone else because then when we do make decisions, when we have to uh, move forward on things, we can go back to that and say, uh, well, the reason that I did that, and here you are talking to yourself, the reason I did that was because I believe this, and it is so strong in me, it's non-negotiable. So when you have some bottom line standards like that, um, it's important to to repeat those to yourself um, you know, frequently so that you can remember and so that you have that standard to go back to. Absolutely. We talk about that sometimes being a true north you know, uh, sort of a, an internal compass that keeps us on course uh, when things get difficult. Mm -hmm. Jeff, you might want to check your microphone. It's popping a little bit. I don't know which microphone you're using, but you might want to check that. Oh, really? I'm just using the one from the, uh, the one connected with the camera here. So. Okay. It's got a little bit of popping going on. Maybe you've got the volume on that turned up or something. Okay. So the other thing I wanted to say about about um, uh, who you are and what you stand for, this, of course, all eight of these steps tie in with each other. They overlap to some degree, but um, we'll get to one in a little while about fear, and I think this is where you can pull in family, friends, colleagues who believe in you after you have really uh, made it clear who you are and what you stand for and that can really help address the fear factor. We're going to get to the fear thing in a little bit because that's one of the steps. Sure. So let's, uh, let's move on here. And uh, one of the things that happens uh, is that uh, as we, we engage these things of making the fundamental choice and continuously realigning our behavior. It changes what I see in my situation and how I respond to it and then I begin to experience myself as a creative force uh, in that situation as well. Then the third step is to embrace the hypocritical step uh, the hypocritical self and that essentially means that even after I discover and, and I'm able to articulate who I am and what I stand for there's still quite a bit of gap sometimes between uh, who I say I am and what I say I stand for and what I actually do. And, uh, and that's where we have to realize that in, in some cases, in some situations, uh, that we do actually behave in a hypocritical manner. However, it's really hard to, become, to come by because we're often not willing to be honest with ourselves and we really exist as if our hypocrisy does not exist. 
but that that gets to be uh, a, a dangerous situation because um, when I'm living in a hippo hypocritical state, uh, my hypocrisy actually divides me from myself. But um, when I embrace my hypocrisy and, and am willing to admit that yes, in some situations or in this particular situation, m m my behavior or my words are not lining up uh, with what I profess, um, then that gives me the opportunity to actually change. And once I change, uh, that allows me to actually become the message because my words and my actions come together in a way that demonstrates integrity. So, Renee, what would you add to that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it adds to your credibility when you're willing to say, oh, look, I realize that I preach one thing and do something else. I mean, how many times do you hear people say, well, that person's not practicing what they preach, or he told me this and said that about what he believed, but he sure didn't act that way when he got into a bind. You saw, you know. So you, you end up getting criticized um, most of the time behind your back and sometimes openly if you are hypocritical, if you say one thing and do another. I hope that the picture that you've shared on the slide isn't what people think all the time when they're shaking hands and smiling at someone but what they really want to do is wring their neck. Um, but it just shows that most of the time, this picture illustrates that well, most of the time people will recognize the hypocritical uh, nature of things but and they'll know it on the inside and they'll have an emotion and a reaction to that but they will not be sharing it on the outside and how it will come out later is either in lost clients, lost business, uh, they just won't come to you anymore, they avoid you, whatever, things like that. So there are consequences and it's just better to be honest up front and someone that I was talking to this week uh, pointed out that there really is a difference between honesty and truthfulness. Um, honesty is more about your how you are with a situation. Truthfulness is more about facts. So I think the power comes when we take the truth and then put real honesty with that and if we're honest with ourselves and truthful with ourselves that's where it really gets um, uh, cleansing you could say because it really makes us think long and hard about how we will handle situations. That is a really good point. I've never really thought about a difference between honesty and, and truth. Well, I didn't either till this person said it to me and, and I just thought, wow, now there's something to be considered. I mean, yeah. you've got to think about that. It's right. it's it's there. So mm -hmm. So what you're saying, honestly, honesty is more subjective. It is how I how I am feeling, how I am relating, how I am thinking. Mm -hmm. And truth is more objective. Right. Here Here's the facts of the situation. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, you can argue on both of those um, down some lines that talk about how both of those can be gray areas, even truth can be, um, depending on how you look at something. So both of those could be discussed more, but I think the point was just what you said, that the honesty piece and the truth piece really are, are different in their characteristics, and so putting them together uh, makes it even more powerful, especially when you are talking about yourself and dealing mm. with your own hypocrisy. Right. And once we get that continuity between uh, between what we say we are and what and, and what others actually see, mm -hmm. that those things line up. That w what I say I am and what I actually do is the same thing, then that builds an, an incredible amount of integrity, credibility, trust, people believe I'm honest. Right, and then the opposite is true too, people, you will lose credibility 
and people will not believe you're an honest person and they will think that the truth doesn't matter to you if you consistently live demonstrating hypocrisy and you never admit it um, and then if you're called on it if you're called on the carpet and you refuse to admit it that makes it even worse <laughs> so it's just better to go ahead and take some self-evaluation frequently and take a look at that and see if there's any areas that need to be addressed there well let's move on uh, then to our, our fourth uh, step which is uh, transcending uh, fear would you like to talk this one through a little bit Renee yes I think fear is probably the underlying reason why we don't do most things that come to our mind uh, seems like maybe a good idea or a possibility but we immediately strike it down for fear of something it could be as uh, significant as fear of losing my job or fear of losing my spouse uh, or fear of um, even the most simplest thing fear of being late I mean it can be practical it can be conceptual but fear drives a lot of what we do so the thing about fear is that what we call out here is the fact that deep personal change always means experiencing some kind of a negative emotion you just can't stir things up and move things around without some emotion and sometimes it's afraid you're afraid of hurting someone else in the process um, again the best thing there is don't be hypocritical uh, with yourself or others and tell the truth and be honest and that is always the best thing to do fear is something that you can talk to someone on the phone one night and get a good pep talk and feel like I'm not afraid anymore I can do this thing and then when you wake up in the morning you're right back to where you started so again I think it's part of this idea of bringing family friends and colleagues around you who you trust who believe in you when you are going through deep change and to continually go back to those people to help you manage uh, and put really put away this fear factor so that you can move through and grow in deep change yeah uh, that's, you know I really want to uh, share something here uh, an experience where where um, we went into deep change where I was really motivated out of fear uh, and I'll just share a little bit of that personally and maybe we can sort of talk this through a little bit because it, it's a little bit antithetical to what we were we've been talking about mm -hmm. and, and, other, and choosing deep change uh, in, in spite of fear well uh, before you go into that let me say this there's one thing about fear Fear is not always bad because it's designed, that whole idea of fear is put in us, it's part of us, designed to keep us from danger. So right. you have to remember that fear itself might be a tool in your toolbox, so to speak. Just make sure that you look at it very, very carefully. So, yeah. you know, that fear could be because there's a red flag going up that's right. one thing that is one thing but more that is not nearly as often as more um, types of fear that are are based out of um, unhealthy ways of looking at things okay I just had to say that because sometimes fear is a good warning sign right uh, and it is uh, but you'll you'll get this immediately uh, but you know when we were finishing our master's degrees mm-hmm and I wanted to uh, start to work on my doctorate which meant us moving to another state, another city, um, another school. Uh, that move for us and for me particularly was motivated out of fear. I feared that um, 
that if I did not continue my education at that point, that I never would. You know, I just would never go back. I would never get it done. Uh, and so uh, we moved our whole family around that. And at least initially, at the beginning of that, uh, you know, it was pretty tough. It was actually, when I look back on it, um, I, I think, oh, boy, I wish I, I wish I had known what I know now. Uh, I could have uh, uh, trusted uh, uh, myself and trusted the Lord a little bit more than I did. I probably wouldn't have made the same decision because it, it because now I realize it was motivated a lot out of fear. And there were some negative things that really came out of that progression, I think, for our family. And uh, now, over time, things, you know, turned out very positively for us, and we wouldn't be the people that we are today, wouldn't have done the things that we've done today, really, if that decision hadn't hadn't been put in place. But I'm just wondering, you know, what if you remember anything uh, about that, what your perspective was, how do you see it now? Um, anything you want to add to that? Well, I think there were a lot of good reasons to, to do that, to try that uh, avenue, but Probably it was not a good reason, the the fear, which seemed to be a pretty big piece of that. Um, I don't think it was a good reason to do it, but I also think that people make mistakes. And, I mean, if we look at that, maybe we thought, and I'm trying to remember now, if there was a time during the living out of that move and that whole thing when we thought this, it was a mistake to come. I think instead of that, we really tried to say, well, uh, well, if we knew then what we know now, we may not have moved, but we really did look for all of the positive things in that, and we tried to hang some hooks around in our mind and emotion to remind us what kind of emotions we were hanging there with that experience so that if we ever ran up against anything like it again we would have a better perspective on it so I recall it being um, you know the experience had some negatives in it but overall there's so many other factors that were feeding into the whole experience that I don't think that we necessarily thought oh well that was a mistake and it just messed us up forever. It's certainly not because so much of what happened after that, even though it was motivated by by fear, so much of what happened after that turned out to be good that, you know, I think it was okay. So I think it's how you handle it when you're realizing, oh, I was motivated by fear and maybe that wasn't the best thing and maybe this was a mistake or whatever. Then you have to just make sure that how you go forward is good. Absolutely, and I think we we certainly did. We we definitely yes, I think we did. We made we made really good um, out of a situation that could have been, you know, um, a slightly downward spiral. So I think it yeah. turned out good. Yeah, it did. I mean, like I said, we wouldn't be the people we are today had we not gone through uh, that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just wanted to throw that one out there a little bit because it's a little different twist uh, from uh, from what we've been talking about in terms of you know there's this change that I know I need to make mm -hmm. and I don't want to be afraid to make that change. Mm -hmm. and in that case, it was actually a really deep change that <laughs> that was motiva motivated motivated uh, by by fear and then uh, and then we sort of did all the other steps that were involved in it and then came out uh, with a really good product there at the at the end mm-hmm that's right all right so uh, let's let's move on then to uh, 
to our next uh, slide here. And this talks about uh, that one of the ways that we, we really transcend fear is, or have the strength to transcend fear, is uh, our fundamental choice. When we really know who we are and what we stand for, then we have that capacity to, uh, to move beyond our fear. And then the, the other point here is that uh, if you're really going to engage uh, transformational change, deep change, uh, you have to be willing to uh, take risk. And uh, transformational leaders, uh, they're willing to, to challenge existing traditions and beliefs both in themselves uh, in others and in the organization and, and that that can be qu quite risky and and frankly it takes uh, courage uh, to be able to do that. Is there anything you'd like to add to that Renee? No I liked that. I thought that was a pretty good summary. Good. So once we have uh, envisioned uh, what it is to be a, a productive community and again that productive community is is when I envision a certain situation that I would like to see changed when I think about what it would be like if everybody involved in that situation was actually uh, working for the benefit of each other. Oh uh, you can use the subjunctive there if everyone were uh, did I not use the subjunctive? No, you didn't use the subjunctive there, and neither did you use it on the radio today. I forgot about it until now, but yeah. Oh, well. We probably ought to be each other's grammar, uh, grammar Nazis, you know. Pardon moi, madame. <laughs> je suis désolé, hein? Oh, yeah, right. No, je vais essayer de faire... Je parlais avec le subjunctive. Oui, le subjonctif. Okay. So All right. Word. So, a little digression into French there. So, um, anyway. So. You're going back to the common good here. <laughs> yes, going back to the common good after I've, I've been uh, thinking about the subjunctive. Okay. I distracted you. Okay. The common good is, uh, you know, we, we envision what that community would look like if everyone were, were working go. for the benefit of each other. And if uh, the leaders in that situation were also uh, viewing themselves as servants to everyone else. So when you when you envision a situation and how you want it to change and what it would be like if it really did change, how would how would people be treating each other? How would the leaders be treating uh, their followers? And you being a leader in that situation then have to actually come to physically represent uh, that vision. You have to become a living symbol of what the organization or the community group uh, or the family actually needs to become. People need to see that vision being lived out in your life first. Hmm. And and there's quite a bit of, of research now that shows that the unique characteristics of a leader for good or for ill will become embedded in the culture of a group. In other words, um, if I am an angry leader, then probably there's going to be uh, 
a good deal of anger expressed down the line as well. Hmm. Uh, if I, if one of my characteristics as a, as a leader is being uh, uh, generous with praise, then it's likely that there there will be uh, more generosity of praise down the line uh, than there would have been had I not been uh, a leader that was generous in praise. So, you know, it's really interesting. Sometimes we think of the leader as the face of the organization, uh, but not only is the leader the face of the organization, it becomes uh, more than that. The, the heart, the soul uh, of the leader begins to be reflected in, in the organization itself. So, having said that, does that mean that a person has to be the top leader before they can begin to bring about uh, that vision of the common good? And the answer to that is simply no, because anyone can bring about transformational change just beginning to act uh, in their interactions with, uh, with others, in the way uh, they display their attitudes and, and their behaviors. If, if anyone starts to act based on what is good for all of us instead of what is just good for me, I begin to plant seeds, if you will, of that common good, that vision for the common good within the group. Anything you'd like to say about that, uh, Renee? No, well, yes. I think you did a great job summarizing all of that and just being, be who you want others to be. I mean, that's pretty much it, isn't it? Absolutely. Be, uh, not be just what you want others to be, but be what you want your organization to be. Be what you want your com community to be. Uh, you know, how would we think about that in terms of community dynamics? If, if we want uh, our community leaders to be honest uh, in our deal in their dealings, then uh, we also need to be honest in, in our dealings as well. Well, this one also overlaps with the hypocritical self and transcending fear because if you are honest and uh, open about that you would like to be a person that does embody this vision for the common good, um, could you be flawless in executing that all the time? No way. You know, we're going to make mistakes, and sometimes we will not do uh, some of the things that we say are the very best because we're not perfect. So when people call you on it, then you have to say, you know what, you're right. Uh, not quite up to snuff on this here right now. And be okay with the fact that you're not perfect and be okay with uh, saying I'm sorry. Good point. Excellent point. Well, let's move on. To disturbing the system. And that is one disturbed dolphin right there. I was going to say, what is that picture? <laughs> I think it's a dolphin. <laughs> but, I mean, that dude looks like he is really he looks disturbed. Unhappy. He looks yeah. He's an albino dolphin. Yeah. Maybe he's been bullied by someone that doesn't appreciate his albino self. I don't know, but that dolphin is not happy. Yeah. When we disturb the system, uh, we really need to create uh, what sometimes people will will uh, feel is a sense of chaos. 
Um, you really have to shake up the status quo in order to move beyond uh, the present situation. Because remember what we talked about. In normal change, things begin to deviate from the norm and our goal is to bring it back to the norm. But when we want deep change, we actually want to shake up the norm, move beyond it, and create a new norm, as you have pointed out. And that can feel uh, very chaotic if when you're going through it. But it's not really chaotic. Uh, it's just that uh, transformational change agents, they get in there, they improvise, and they're really not afraid to admit that they're improvising in order to create uh, an urgency uh, for moving beyond where we are. But uh, what they're trying to create is not, not chaos. Chaos would be a total breakdown uh, where things uh, were just overwhelming. They're not really interested in, in, in creating chaos, but they are interested in creating enough instability that we can move beyond where we are. And they often do that by putting out really high standards that are really going to cause people to stretch to a new level. And Quinn suggests that when we do that, that this is the this statement represents the attitude in which that should be done. It goes something like this. The leader says, here's the standard which I know is impossible. So let's stand together and learn our way into a higher level of performance. Hmm. What would you like to add to that, Brene? Well, what about in a personal way, how, how would this go? This all sounds very theoretical. So I think about deep change. Let's say if you lose your job or someone dies, and this is a very serious situation. Everything is going to change. Well, you might feel paralyzed at first, and there might be something that is going to cause you to change a lot about how you live your life, but you can disturb the system by already going ahead and proactively taking some steps that need to be taken in order for a new normal to take shape. And once you do that, uh, you have proactively chosen to create a situation where there are a lot of things that are in flux but you know they have to be in order to find your new way. Um, sometimes when something bad happens, there's a sense of, of paralysis and you don't change things for, for as long as you can stand it because at least if there were things that are the same, you know what that is like. Uh, something as practical as when someone dies, you don't touch the things in their room for a really long time because you know once you do that sets you on a different path of acceptance and moving forward and some people want to remember longer and they they resist that they resist that um, the next thing is if you know you need to get on the road and move somewhere you have to start doing things like I'm talking about a move like a move from one area to another your whole household a physical move you have to put your house on the market you have to um, send your resume out and do some different things. You have to start doing research in, in other areas and seeing where you might want to move. All those things are disturbing. They're disturbing to your daily life. They're disturbing to what you think about. Uh, they're disturbing because you're going to be distracted then by your realtor and other people who are returning calls and doing things. And All of a sudden your whole routine is messed up because you're trying to get your act together to so that everything can coalesce again in a new normal. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Sounds really, I really appreciate the way you framed uh, some practical situations there and it brings me back to thinking about when we find ourselves in that situation. 
we have to make a decision either, hey, I'm going to move forward into that new normal, or I'm going to have the illusion that I can just stagnate where I am. And, and when we make that decision that, oh, well, I'm just going to try and batten down the hatches, you know, and just sort of hunker down, uh, that really we're making a choice, uh, as Quinn would say, towards slow death. Because if we're, if we're not moving forward, if we're not embracing that newness and, and willing to, to move beyond uh, into a, that new level of being, that um, trying to hunker down and just stay where I am, uh, you know, uh, it's not gonna, it's not gonna really breathe life into my soul in 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 the long run. And I've heard somebody say, lots of people die when they're 25, and they wait another 75 years for their body to catch up with them. You know. Yes, and I can see um, really some people will say about and and I keep re referring back to job situations because I'm around a lot of people who share stuff with me about job about how they feel about their job or their employer or whatever because I work with businesses and so uh, people will say things like well you know um, I really can't stand my job but there's nothing else out there so I'm just you know I'm just hanging in. And you ask them how they're doing, and they'll say, oh, same old, same old. You know, I'm just hanging in there, and I'm thinking. And then they'll say, well, you know, I'm just settling for this. I guess I'll just settle for this. You know, well, first of all, um, settling, that's a whole other subject we could talk about. I don't, I don't really think you should ever settle. Why should you settle when you have a choice? But, and you do have a choice. Even if you think you don't, you still, you do. And so then the other thing is, I think actually settling is slow death. I think that is slow death. So why don't we just quit using the word settle and just say, well, I've decided I'm just having a slow death right here, you know, because that's, that's really the way it is. And so there's no riding the fence. That settling thing, I just think people say that, but it's really the slow death is what they're experiencing. And there's a lot that goes along with that, you know. If, if we cannot convince ourselves to take that risk and move forward to something new, better, different, however you want to, whatever you want to call that, just taking the first step of even trying to look for another job takes a lot of effort, you know, and it's, you do disturb the system because now you have to put some effort out, you know, and you have to put these resumes out and then you have to call and then you have to take calls and then you might have to go on an interview and that's really new and different and uh, you might have to take unpaid time off of work to go do that. So. There are all kinds of implications that happen when you disturb the system um, and when you decide that you're not going to settle for the slow death. Absolutely. Wow. You know, in Georgia, we would say, you've stopped preaching and gone to meddling now. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're really hitting down into to, to the heart of the matter. So let's, let's go on then to... Um, to the next step, which is to surrender to the emergent process. You know, in normal change, we can feel sort of comfortable uh, because uh, it's incremental change, and we can have some control over the over the process, how fast it goes, how deep it goes. Um, how much time is going to take in lots of cases. But when we begin to really disturb the system and to put in play actions that are going to take us to uh, a new uh, productive community that we've envisioned but that we don't yet have and we're figuring out together how we, how we get there but we've moved so far that uh, going back to the old place is, is as risky as continuing to go forward in a way. And, and so then you just really have to 
be so committed to uh, who you are, what you stand for, and for what the community stands for, that uh, you're willing to go through that deep level of uh, uncertainty. And uh, and and you have to fight through the resistance because there will be uh, resistance when you start moving into deep change because the system doesn't want to change. The system wants to go back to normal. And so it's, it's going to fight you. And by system, I mean the system of relationships that are that are at play here. It's not some nebulous concept that's going to be resisting you. It's going to be uh, individuals and groups of individuals mm -hmm. uh, that are going to be uh, resistant. And, and dealing with that is, is in one of the places where we, we get really, really fearful and need to uh, transcend our fear. And it, it really, when we put ourselves in that kind of risky situation where we're actually uh, risking our personal or professional well-being for the well-being of the group, uh, that's really not normal because the normal way of doing things is to look out for number one. And right. that's where uh, Quinn pins this wonderful, wonderful quote that has right. become my you got favorite. To read that. You read that on the radio show, so I get to read it now. Okay, go ahead. Because I love it too. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Here's what Robert E. Quinn says. Now here is a heretical thought. Leadership is not about results. It is about commitment. The entire management literature fails to understand this. Leadership authors do not understand that leadership means go forth to die. If they did understand it, they would not be enticed to write about it because people do not want to hear this message. Most people want to be told how to get extraordinary results with minimum risk. They want to know how to get out-of-the-box results with in-the-box courage. Isn't that wonderful? It's just yeah. so great. I mean, it's so, it's, it explains it so well. And uh, in his book, Quinn talks about the image of the leader developing from the old uh, military tradition of putting the person out with, out, uh, with the flag out in front of the troops as they advanced. The person with the flag was the leader, was leading the troops forward. And they were usually the first people to get shot. Yep. You know, and so there was a great deal of, of risk. And you had to be really committed to grabbing that flag and moving forward. But that's the kind of leadership that it takes to be a transformational leader. A transformational leader doesn't stand behind the troops. A transformational leader stands in front of the troops and holds up the flag and says, here we go, here I go, come with me. And, uh, and that's the kind of thing that really rallies people and they see that it's dangerous and they see that there's a high probability of failure but they're inspired to to move on and uh, I really like what Quinn says here that that normal people don't engage transformational change because they have nothing worth dying for again again normal people meaning just the usual uh, or the most common doesn't mean good or bad. Normal right. is weird. It's a, a normal yeah. view of the world in where change is 
what we want to do is maintain the status quo. Right. If, if your concern is maintaining the status quo, you can never lead transformational change. You can never lead the kind of change that's going to really fundamentally change your situation. Right. And you know what? A lot of people pine after this kind of change uh, in their own life. Uh, they pine after the positive version of deep change, uh, wishing or dreaming, daydreaming, fantasizing about a deep change that would that would really be great, you know, something that could really be wonderful for them and for their families. And um, I think with tools in hand to really know how to how to handle, how to navigate a deep change, that you can choose a deep change and you can actually go for it. Um, and also, if a deep change comes to you unexpectedly, that is, in the negative sense, um, loss of something or someone, Again, putting putting the good navigation tools in place like these eight steps can really help to get through that process and come out in the end with something positive. So either way, whether it's unexpected and negative or a positive deep change of, of sorts, it's still, this is all very, very useful for facing that kind of deep change. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, let's move on to the last step in the process, which is to entice through moral power. And if we accept the idea that um, that evil is that which leads to uh, waste and ruin, then virtue is acting in ways that contradict that. Uh, in other words, it, virtue acts in ways that, that counteracts slow death. And uh, a leader is virtuous by what we've already discussed. When, when they know who they are and what they stand for, and they've addressed the issues of hypocrisy, in their life so that their their attitudes and their words and their actions actually line up with who they say they are and what they say they stand for and then they've been able to overcome fear and actually become an embodiment of the change that they want to see in the world then people begin to recognize them uh, as as virtuous leaders because they see them acting for the well-being of everyone. And so, then what happens when the when the virtuous leader calls for self-sacrifice uh, is acceptable to the followers because they've already seen that leader being willing to put him his self or herself uh, on the line for the for the well-being of the group and they right. begin to understand that the well-being of the individual is tied up in the well-being of the group and the well-being of the group is tied up in the well-being of the individual right but let's not confuse this with the persuasive mind uh, uh, washing kind of things that we see happening in cults. Cult leaders um, are known for being able to convince people to do things and that's not what we're talking about at all here. We're talking about people making individual decisions to follow a leader based on what they are observing in that leader. They are not being um, persuaded in a um, perverted type of a way. They are actually attracted to the qualities in the leader that are actually virtuous. So it's, it's a very um, organic and truthful, honest kind of a trust that is being built. Yeah, and that's, um, let's see. There you are. You got your yeah, slides yeah, down. Yeah. 
Hello. Awesome. So, yeah, so when we're talking about enticing by moral power, it's simply that the person has demonstrated uh, moral power in their life that attracts others right. to, to them and, and actually models and leads the way in a, in a positive way. Right. Positive, healthy way, you know, uh, towards the common good, towards the benefit of all. Right. Well, speaking of healthy ways and uh, for the common good, we've been on about an hour, and it's time to wrap up for this um, Google Hangout. Absolutely, it is, and it's been a lot of fun. We're glad that you joined us uh, this evening, and you can find us at wellspiritconsulting.com. Hey, if you enjoyed uh, this Google Hangout, we hope you'll share it with someone and know. Uh, Take a look at our other uh, YouTube videos as well, and we'll be back. Let us know what you like. Let us know what you don't like, and uh, help us create a community of people that want to make business worth living. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.